All right, let's pray again. I'm going to ask Gary Horton, if you would, if you'd open our service up, Gary, with a word of prayer. Father, may this be a completely different perspective of what Christmas really is. It's having the greatest gift. That that gift is a daily orientation to who and what we are and who and what you are. Help us to realize that Christmas is a daily thing. So is Thanksgiving and all the other celebrations that have meaning and purpose because of your word. Thank you for our communicator and our pastor and our teacher who spends his life making these things permanent and relevant in our existence. May we honor and glorify your name. <clears throat> May we never take for granted the fact that we were born anew because of the sacrifice. Make this relevant to our lives, not just this month, but the rest of this year. Mm. And the things that are coming in our country, we have confidence because we have you. Thank you for this time. Teach us, prepare us, use us in spite of ourselves. Thank you, Father. This time in Jesus name. If you have your Bibles, return with me to the book of Romans, if you would. I'm in Corinthians, so I'm dropping back a book. In the fourth chapter, I'm looking at verse 13 because the writer has given a, a wonderful title through the Abrahamic covenant to you and I. We know we're heirs. We know we're heirs, and we'll see that today. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be the heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Now, he tells us how, you, how you're not an heir. So let's get that out of the way right, right away. You'll never be an heir of God or an heir of the world of God if you think you get there by works. It's not religious works that get you there. It's not good works that get you there. He just said that. Now, let's look at that. The promise to Abraham and to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law. But, in contrast, through the righteousness of faith. We've been talking in this series about justification by faith. Justification by faith. And so the writer comes back and we're going to talk about what does it mean to be an heir of the world? And who is that? Who is that? Was that just to Abraham and his descendants? And, and was that the point that the writer was making? Mm -mm. No, nah, I can tell you right now, that's not the point. So let me give you, let me give you a few points about this. Let me give you a few points. Point number one, Paul is, has followed the same outline of Messianic, Messianic, Messianic history as Matthew. Now watch, in the fourth chapter of Romans, he mentions two people from the old covenant. In his discussion on justification by faith, he mentioned two people of the old covenant. You know who those two were? Could be a gate question. Abraham and who? David, Abraham and David, right? Abraham and... Uh. Abraham and David. 
Let's go to Matthew 1. Hold your place in Romans. Let's go to Matthew. You got you to gotta file a lot because we got to get all the way back to the first book of the New, New Covenant, New Testament. And he opened, Matthew opens his book. Watch how he opens it and watch how he closes it. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You with me? All right. Watch how he, watch how he begins the genealogy in verse 2. It begins with Abraham. It wasn't the way he introduced him. He's talking about Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant. These two great covenants all pointed, watch this now, all pointed to the new covenant, which Jesus pointed to at the Last Supper. The blood of the new covenant. Both of these men's their covenant they're, they're both of them. They, they, when you put these two, two great covenants together in Christ, the Messiah, it's going to stretch through the first coming to the second coming before it's completed. Now, in the Old Testament, they didn't talk about a first and second coming. They just talked about a coming of Christ. The church is what separated the two comings. And so he goes through a list. I'm not going to go through the list. That's not my purpose. I just wanted to show you that Paul is using Matthew's outline because of the significant importance of Abraham and David, which he's talking about in chapter 4 of Romans, and he's discussing the new covenant justification by faith. Christ. What did Abraham point to? The coming of Christ. What did David point to? The coming of Christ. But we didn't know that there was going to be a first and second until Christ actually left the earth and the church began. Then we realized when Jesus left the earth and went and seated at the right hand of God the Father that there was going to be a separation of the first and second comings. Because there still is a whole a tribulational period. There is a millennial period that still is out there in the future. The two covenants, Abraham and David, point to the new covenant and this concept. And Paul is telling you that. This is Paul's informational background. And what he is pinpointing is heirs. When you study Matthew, when you study Matthew 1 through 17, what you get is the seed heir. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, patriarch period. Then you have the Sethite. Well, that's earlier. Then it pushes on to David and forward. What you're talking about in the Abrahamic covenant and in the Davidic covenant, in the Abrahamic covenant, you're talking about one seed. Listen, Abraham, listen, it was easy to figure the one seed from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. But then it got crazy. When it got to Jacob, he had 12 kids. He's only supposed to have one, right? What are you having 12 kids for? You're making this really difficult. And not only did he have a bunch of kids, but he had a different bunch of wives. I mean, you know, family got crazy out there. But out of that, they put one tribe was picked, and out of the one, right, Judah, and out of the one tribe of Judah was picked the house of David, and, and the house of David was picked Joseph and Joseph and Mary, and da, 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 you know. Right. Just. Matthew traced the heir, see? Each one of these people, the genealogy is about the seed heir. And it's going, it's, it's, the, the airship goes all the way to the end of the world 
listen, which is the millennium. Matthew traced the heir of the world through David, through David and a Abraham and David, of the Abraham and Christ, through the genealogy of Jesus Christ. He traced it from Abraham through David. Listen, Matthew does something really interesting. He traced the genealogy through David to Solomon. Luke, when he did the genealogy from Adam to Adam, from the first Adam to the last Adam, when he got to David's genealogy, he went through Nathan. See, people don't get that because they don't study. David, they ran to genealogies. You know why? Because Matthew is talking about the genealogy of Joseph and Luke is talking about the genealogy of Mary. Both of them had to come through David. And they did, we know, when they did the census and they both went to Bethlehem. See, there's stories behind the story in there. The great stories in the Bible are always behind the stories. They're not in them, they're behind them. It's what makes that story dynamic. But, you know, you got to study the Bible to get this stuff. Point number two. Luke's genealogy traced the heir of the world from the first Adam to the last Adam. What they're all tracing is Galatians 3.16. The seed of the Abrahamic covenant is Christ. Although he talks about seeds, he's referring to primarily one seed, and that seed is Christ. So you have, you have like Luke 15, 45. So also it is written. The first man, Adam, which is described out of Luke 338, became a living soul, Genesis 2, 7. The last Adam, which is Jesus Christ, Luke 3, 22, 23, became a life-giving spirit. See, that's the story of the genealogies. When you look at both genealogies, you should. The genealogy of the heir of the world of the antediluvian period of human history, which was the first period, passed from the first Adam through the Sethites to the Shemites to Noah and the flood. You know what the flood was of? The world. Now, the Bible understands world probably better than you and I. It wasn't a local flood. We still have those. But you'll never have another flood like they had in Noah's day. And what sign did God give us that it would never be there again? Rainbow. My, my. You need to read Genesis 6 through 9. That's not that long. We have the rainbow. Do we have local floods? Look, do we have local floods? Of course we do. Hurricanes come in and pfft, you hit water if you don't get anything else. This is not what Noah's flood was about. It flooded the world. The, and when it was done, there was no more an Andaluvian world. There's now a post diluvian world. Well, you and I live in the post diluvian period. And there's one more period of human history that's important. It's a millennial period, which is going to be lights out different than both of the other. That's just some pretty good reading, you know. If you want to get into some good history reading, this would just be some pretty good reading for you. In the post-Diluvian period, it listen. 
This is why Abraham and David are important. When you get to the post-Luvian period, you know what you got? You got Abraham and David. Then you got the church. You know, you got Israel, the church. In the post-Diluvian period, it passes through Abraham to David. According to Luke, he runs the Nathan deal because he's getting to Eli, which is the father-in-law of Joseph. In other words, the emphasis is on Mary. Good, study the Bible. Here comes Christmas. We don't know what it's about. We think it's Santa Claus. For the church, it's not about Santa Claus. It's about the birth of the Savior of the world and the uniqueness of how it was done. Boy, when you study the genealogy, I mean, I thought really seriously about adding this course to the School of Biblical Theology because they'll never learn it anyplace else. The genealogy of, the, of Matthew and, and Luke are just out of sight. I've taught it to you, but it's been years probably since I've taught it. You need to come back to it, don't I? Point number three, the promise of the heir of the world expanded across biblical history. By one seed, it came to, fru it came to fulfillment. That seed was Jesus Christ. And we just talked about it in the Christmas Eucharist when God spoke through the angel to Mary about her role in the plan of God of the Savior of the world. By the way, he's in Matthew, the first chapter on your paper, I put down verse 20. He's going to have a conversation with Joseph too. And it's going to be just as dramatic for him as it was for Mary. Just a different way. Let me tell you, when God shows up at your door and knocks, it's going to be a dramatic moment for your life. It'll be a wonderful one. But you've got to learn how to walk by faith now. Because when he knocks on your door, it's not going to be a walk, it's going to be a run. You're going to have to run the race. You're going to have to run the race. And you better have your act together. You better know how, how this thing works by faith, how faith is cycled. And you're going to have to cycle your faith on a dead run. Are you prepared for that? If you are, before you die, there's going to be a knock on your door before you die. You should want that knock. Because then you will know in your heart why you logged all the hours of your study and why you, God just put in your heart you should be just so faithful with the word of God. Then he reveals it to you. And he does things in your life that's impossible. He tells Mary, I'm going to do things that are impossible. Just hold on, honey. Just hold on. You're in for the ride of your life. I'm going to show you, show you such things are, are impossible. I'll tell you, when I went with, with Billy Graham... I lived every day living in the impossibles. I mean, impossibles. You need those experiences in your life. You need to see the power of God be so out there so much greater than your, your choices or your mind could imagine or you could write a story about. They're so far out there. That you'll have no other options than to walk by faith. Because sight would even get a glimpse of all the magnitude that God will do in your life. I, I wish that for your life. I wish that for your life. I hope at some point you'll wish it for yours. 
The promise of the heir of the world expanded through biblical history of the one seed, Jesus Christ, into the fulfillment. And what are the writers teaching us? They're teaching us about the faithfulness of God to his plan. You know what, he, you know what he's telling Mary? He's telling Mary, Mary, you walk it, and I'll perform it. I'll give you a Romans 4.21 in your life. That what I've promised, I will do. You know why Mary said, then do unto me according to your word. <laughs> Did she not have it down? That's why she was picked. Then do it. Then do it. You want God to do it too, let me tell you. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, faithful is he who calls you and he also will bring it to pass. You should circle that. That's when the rubber hits the pavement. When the rubber hits the pavement is where your faith is going to take you to the finish line. You're going to fight the good fight of faith to the finish. You're going to run that course to the finish. You're going to run it by faith. And listen, God has promised to bring it to pass. Galatians 4, 4 and 5, Merry Christmas. That should have been spelt with an A, shouldn't it? I should have spelt that with an A. But when the fullness of time had come, hello, Mary, God sent forth his son born of a woman, born under the law, so he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, watch this now, exclamation mark, Father, exclamation mark. He separated them. To show you the identity. That Abba, that's God who cares about the birth and the growth of a child. Just call me daddy. And for that mature believer who God wants to, his plan to fold them into a great ministry opportunity, call me father. You're an adult. Call me father. You're an adult. Call me father. You're a father. Call me a father. Because when you're called a father, it comes from my name. My name is father. I let you use it. Our father who art in heaven. If you're a father, he's let you borrow the name. You should live up to it. Four, where am I, John? What I got? I got a few minutes? Hour. I know I ain't got no hour, Bubba. My stomach tells me I got an hour. Under the new covenant, every person who believes that Jesus died for his sins was buried and on the third day of his burial raised from the dead receives God's justification by faith. I laid out the gospel for you on your paper. Listen to Romans 4, 24 and 25. But for our sakes also, Talking about the old covenant, now the new covenant. To whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered over because of our transgressions, Adam's sin, and was raised because of our justification. You ought to, you ought to, you ought to get those two verses in your soul. Romans 8, 16 and 17. Here is, here is a promise from God's heart to yours. 
the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. Has he done that in your life? He has if you're saved. Before I got saved, when I was a little boy, I thought there might be a God. Then as I grew up into my educational years, I wasn't sure. Then I got into some, well, kind of almost like when you move to the state of Alabama, you either have to be an Auburn fan or an or a Alabama fan or an Auburn fan. At a certain part of my life, in my educational background, I had to choose whether I believed in God or didn't believe in God. It was kind of like, kind of like being in Alabama. So I looked at science and evidence and chose to be an atheist. Didn't believe there was a God. I just thought it was an adult thing that I had to do through my educational. I had strong teachers on that principle that made very strong arguments. And I had nobody on the other side countering them until I moved to the South and went to UAB. in preparation, hopefully, to be accepted to go to dental school. I met a person who explained to me the gospel of Jesus Christ and his connection to, to God. And you talk about something that sounded really screwy to me. It was that deal. This guy who died on a cross 2,000 years ago, <laughs> raised from the dead, <laughs> alive today, will come into your heart if you just believe. <laughs> that was a pretty big pill to swallow. That may not have been a big pill for you because you were raised in a Christian home and you're thankful for that. I wasn't. I didn't have that background. I didn't have that other argument in my life until I was in the South. They may have had it in the north. They just didn't run in my circles. <laughs> should have, shouldn't I? Somebody should have run in my circle because I was lost as Hogan's goat. They didn't. But down here, I wasn't here very long. and it, Somebody popped into my circle, challenged me. What a crazy idea that was. And listen. What a truism that the only way to God is Jesus Christ. And if you go through Christ, you will find God and you will find more about God and his greatness and his power, his authority and his love. But you're not going to find that unless you go through the gospel of Christ. It's the, it's the system. It's the way it works. No man comes to the father except through me. And I can tell you, The spirit. Now, I didn't know what it was, but listen, I got saved one day and the next day, I just knew that I, I was connected with God. It was only later that I read 
the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're a child of God. And when that dawned on me, and, and when somebody gave me the scriptures to justify what I was feeling, I felt like, I think I really believe in God. I, I think there's a real, I think there's a, I think I've just, I think somehow or another, I've just met God. And that I had a real hunger to know more about him. And it got me to where I am today. I mean, he's my Abba Father. There was a time in my life as I spiritually grew, I really needed him as my Abba. I couldn't even imagine him as a father. I, I needed him so bad as my Abba. My daddy that just... Picked me up when I stumbled and cleaned me up when I got dirty and was always there for me. Then when I got to the maturity, that I understood, oh, I'm responsible. I, I've got to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Oh, I've got to walk by faith and not by sight. And begin to act mature. Then I noticed that God had become my father. He was a father figure in me as an adult. And that connection has helped me to understand my responsibility as a father to adult children. That was so important in my life as an adult. My father, I went to my father with adult questions and problems. And he was there just like he was for me as an Abba. Do you know that? I mean, is he listen, at some point, you just got to grow up. He'll always be your Abba. He'll always be there to pick you up. And he'll always be there to be, to clean you up and change your diapers and do all those things. But at some point, you've got to take some responsibility. He wants you to be an adult, to an adult. He wants you to have an adult relationship with him, a spiritual adult relationship. He wants you to be the adult in the room with another adult. Well, that's it for me today. If there's extra points, I would highly recommend you study them. I felt they were important to put them into the element of the study. We're going to close. We're going to do a pledge and be dismissed for the day. So, uh, Rick, if you'll pledge us out of here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.